please so we can make a start please uh, this session uh, is probably the most talked about and the least understood so we just need to bring a little bit of clarity take a little bit of hype out of it and get real and we have two people who with we are familiar uh, Nicholas Berry from Norton Rose, who heads their uh, InsureTech uh, services, and Lutfi Bashuse, who is actually on the call face. So hopefully, between them, they could be able to enlighten us. And the moderator is Reza Zain, who actually, we have, uh, I had a Malaysian friend, and I said, what is your job? He said to me, I am a sniffer. I said, what is a sniffer? He said, I sniff for business, and I take it wherever I get it. So that's Razat for you. Thank you, Razat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iqbal. Um, so uh, we're all back from a lovely meal. Yeah? And we, um, for me, every time I come back to, um, to Takaful, yeah, it's like, it's the opportunity to meet again old friends yeah, and make new ones. Yeah? And within this the, the Takaful industry, what I like is that there's this degree of friendliness and of, uh, of, of openness and of discussion, a bit like a big family. Yeah? And what is good is that whenever a family has got issues or challenges, we discuss amongst each other and we try to find solutions. We are uh, fortunate today yeah, to uh, have two very distinguished speakers. Yeah? I'm going to let both of them uh, introduce themselves, and then I'm going to give them both the floor so that we can give an overview of uh, the, uh, an enigmatic term in short tech, but one which uh, has a, potentially a very bright future for uh, our industry and for our world. Yeah? Uh, over to you, gentlemen. Thanks. Shall I, shall I go first? I've got, I've, so my name is Nicholas Berry. Uh, I'm a corporate and regulatory insurance partner at Norton Rose Fulbright. So I, my main practice area focuses on transactional work and regulatory work in the insurance space. I, I, I don't focus on any other sector. Um, I act for people like Zurich, uh, private equity clients like Aquiline on M&A and transactional work. For the last, <clears throat> probably for the last five to six years, I've noticed, you know, initially that the insurance sector was going to have an increasing interest in insurtech, which was a word that didn't actually exist then, but fintech did exist, um, because our banking clients were taking it up. And normally, um, about 18 months after our banking clients adopt something, our insurance clients do, they tend to be a bit behind the curve um, in terms of uptake. And I initially was interested in it because I thought these small insure techs were going to be disruptive and probably be acquired um, by our insurers or the, um, the sort of private equity clients we, we work for. Um, but actually, it's been a very different outcome. There's been a lot of investment rounds and funding from VCs, but there's also been a lot of collaboration between our insurance clients and insure techs. So in the insure tech space now, I do work for startups, you know, genuinely launching novel businesses, but also um, a lot of strategic partnerships between our big institution insurance clients and startups looking to partner with them. I think initially there was perhaps some, I'm not going to say delusion, but it's, it's a word that's quite close to that from insurtechs that they could just come along and disrupt insurance in the way that perhaps peer-to-peer -peer lending or other um, startup uh, businesses did in, in, in the banking sector. And I think that's largely been proved uh, 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 something that they haven't been able to do and really they've been heavily dependent on collaboration and buy-in from, from insurers. And that really has in some ways moved um, where, sort of our work and involvement in the space. The other thing that um, we've actually been quite heavily involved in is uh, in the banking and financial services spaces, there have been a lot of consortia projects, particularly to do with supply chain management, looking at the use of blockchain and, and other new technologies, um, particularly around provenance and reliability of information, 
which obviously has real relevance in the insurance sector. Um, and I've, I've acted on uh, two consortia projects in the insurance space um, between you know, big end clients, insurers and reinsurers, trying to establish a, effectively an ecosystem or network of participants and information flows to, to use this technology to um, make, make insurance more efficient. Um, but you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a bit more about um, the detail of those when I give my presentation. And uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Lotfi Bakush. I'm a co founder of an insurtech, uh, Versi 60. I've uh, been involved in the space for over five years now and still very early stage. That's how it feels, at least. <laughs> um, at the same time, I'm advising the incumbents, and uh, previously I worked uh, in senior positions at. Uh, uh, some of the household names such as uh, Chubb Insurance and Citibank and um, uh, Aspen Re. Um, so um, the angle I will be taking today and uh, hopefully we'll get engaged with you guys. I'm, 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 I'm still fascinated. I don't think there is a solution yet, but I'm still fascinated between the legacy model, the TechCaffle model, and now add the InsureTech dimension and whether this is going to open up new opportunities from a TACAFL perspective or not. And uh, we'll invite you to think along with us as we engage more in the presentations. Thank you. Who of your gentlemen wants to start? Depends whose slides are up first. <laughs> Okay, so what I uh, thought that we should start with is a, just a little bit of a snapshot in terms of what's happening in the insure tech space. Um, we're not going to get technical. It's more of a trend and uh, probably trying to differentiate between the hype and the reality and read a little bit more underneath what the headlines uh, say. Um, so um, start with the capital first, because we're going to set the scene in terms of, um, and people might disagree with this, but this is a personal opinion I have based on my uh, following the TACAFL for so long. I think the TACAFL model, uh, you know, needless to say, is still facing some challenges for many reasons. I call them the quadruple uh, whammy. And essentially, I think, you know, if you do want to divide it, you know, I think the TACAFL is facing a lot of challenge from scaling up perspective. I still, uh, you know, in many main regions, not, not across all the Islamic world, but in many main regions, uh, there's a slow growth now for the last, you know, from 2016, 2017, 2018, there's a bit of a slow growth, probably predicated a little bit by the economic conditions uh, going on in, you know, in the Middle East and, and what have you. But all along, the track record is not uh, something to write home about. I mean, the uh, Takafu model has uh, suffered from weak profitability, driven by uh, fragmentation in the market, a lot of competitiveness from both conventional and Takafu classes. Um, least, uh, you know, in, in addition to that, there is the operational efficiencies, um, the cost base from a Takafu model is just expensive, and I think it's not sustainable and competitive. Um, and asking a policyholder to pay a premium just because it's a TACAFL label um, uh, proved not to be, uh, didn't get a lot of traction unless it's mandated like in certain markets like Saudi Arabia and, and, and some GCC countries. And last not least, and this has been brewing for the last probably few years, in, in, in some of the coal markets, um, they've been also... Uh, uh, dragged by either the Arab Spring or by civil wars and, uh, you know, recently global trade and the sanctions uh, based on, you know, Iran and, and what have you. So the outlook is really not that great, if you ask me. But you can see that also probably it's a, a propent, you know, it's a prop opportunity to probably consolidate and, uh, and reform the sector. So that's my view on the TACAFL. <laughs> Now, I'm going to bring in the insure tech business and see if the, would the insure tech solve some of these issues? I mean, that's a fundamental question. Or otherwise, why are we talking about insure tech in a TACAFL summit? So the, the good news is the insure tech continued to um, uh, actually prosper and grow overall, right? So uh, in terms of both deals and value, um, in 2018 was closed. Sorry about the formatting there. I don't know what's happening, but... That wasn't there in my laptop. <laughs> um, in 
But um, so the, the, the blue is in terms of dollar value, the InsureTech uh, total volume for 2018 based on CBI and Willis uh, reached $4.15 billion. And this is the first year where we saw past 2015. So after 2015, kind of dipped a little bit, but now we gained and we're, uh, we're up in the um, record levels. From, and from a volume perspective as well, we're nearing 300 deals per annum. Uh, that's fantastic. But there are some underlying trends that, you know, you cannot look at this top line figure and think, oh, this is all great. I'm going to start a new insure tech tomorrow. Um, there is a lot that has been learned over the last seven years. Um, uh, and I think if you're in the TACAFL and you probably want to copy some of the insure tech models, you probably need to stop and think a little bit first. The first uh, trend or dif difference is actually in um, the segment. So uh, starting from the same point, uh, actually the property casualty or the non-life sector uh, has prospered or done much better than uh, life and health. Uh, you might think there are many reasons for that. I think the complexity of the product, uh, I, I think also from terms of the distribution structure, the market segment itself, um, probably lent itself for PNC to prosper a bit more. Uh, and the LNH, you know, um, from a duration perspective, the stickiness of the client, um, their long tail, and uh, somehow they're not under the same competitive pressure per se. And life and health in certain markets, I mean, has seen a lot of consolidation. You see a lot of big players. You're not going to see small life players. It's very rare to see small life players. Whereas in PNC, it's more fragmented. You see small, mid-size, and, and large players. So if you're in the tech athlete, you're going to rethink, you know, if your segment is life and health, um, you probably want to study a bit more in terms of what's happening in the insure tech space and why it didn't scale up or succeed as much as the non-life. Now, I'm going to move to the next trend that is actually uh, what I found quite fascinating. And I'm not implying anything here, but I'd like you to think about it and stop, uh, you know, stop for a moment and think about it. I kind of... Uh, uh, if you want to build an analogy, uh, sure tech and uh, TACAFL, the closest it is, and you know, of course, sub subject to Sharia law and governance and what have you, but it's actually the PT P2P model, the peer to peer model. And the peer to peer model in the insure tech space has come under tremendous pressure. And as of late, you know, there's a huge dip in terms of actually startups or success or investment. And the, the numbers you see there, the dips are actually number of deals and transactions. Uh, more, it started with the, you know, the, the peer to peer from a lending perspective. Of course, from an insurance perspective, the peer to peer came in late, but hasn't really taken off. And what's plagued it is many issues not dissimilar to the TACAF. So the operational inefficiencies from a cost structure, it's the low profitability. Uh, so the, the solvency requirements, of course, if you're in insurance or banking, uh, you know, from uh, what you need to, uh, what's required from a capital perspective. And more, uh, if you follow the news as of late, you know, the founding circle and what have you. I mean, there are some even conduct issues in terms of how you're treating customers and, and so on and so on. Um, I tend to think, and this is going to be opened later in the discussion um, in the Q&A, whether, based on the experience we had in insure tech, whether insure tech really can solve tech capital problem. I tend to think probably that the problem for TACAFL is not tech. It's the peer-to-peer -peer structure, which even with the best tech, proved to be still a challenge. So there are some structural issues with the model itself that needs to be rethought, as opposed to we're going to have the best technology and that will solve a lot of our TACAFL issues or peer-to-peer -peer issues. Um, that leads me to probably some concluding remarks. Um, there, are, there is another trend, and I haven't put a slide for it, but there is, a, there is another trend. I mean, uh, Nick mentioned uh, that um, you know, the, 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 the incumbents actually have been sponsoring and funding through CVC and investing in a lot of startups. But if you read the headline news, and I don't have stats for it, but Aviva, as of late, they're retrenching. They're retreating a little bit from investing in the startups uh, and in, you know, in, in, in tech per se. Uh, they're refocusing. And the underlying statement they made in their uh, recent release is focus on commercial fundamentals 
as opposed to we're going to invest left, right, and center and see if anything sticks. The same thing with AXA XL Kaplan. They did exactly the same thing towards the end of last year. They're rationalizing their investment in InsureTech on the basis of we cannot continue to invest endlessly and expect the returns in God knows when. So if you are thinking of InsureTech in the context of tech capital, you've got to go back to the basics. Uh, there are two dimensions. From a tech perspective, uh, you've got to think of the data. You've got to think of prioritizing the tech. There's so much tech. You know, all the buzzwords, IUT, tokens, blockchain, and what have you. And you've got to prioritize what is exactly business should be driving tech, not tech driving business. And then bottom line is you've got to really size up the market and does it make commercial sense or not. That's not tech. That's business. Uh, so, I mean, the, the insured tech is maturing in a way. Still very, still very young. Still, I would say, not even teen yet. But it's maturing in terms of where it's focusing now. So instead of being all things to all people and all tech, you can think of, you know, uh, you, you come up with a tech and then you look for a problem. You come up with a solution, you look for a problem. Now what we're uh, seeing that from a trend is focus on the customer engagement as one vector or dimension. There is the, uh, the, the data itself from a cloud, mobile, IoT, and I think in essence what it boils down to, my blue box, is actually what you're going to do with it. And there are two things you're going to do with it if you're in a tech capital business or if you're in an insurance business. You're going to underwrite and you're going to pay claims. So if you can make the best use of those to, at the end of the day, serve what your core purpose is, which is underwrite, i.e. select the risk, price it, and then when there's a claim, pay it in the most efficient way, then InsurTech can be helpful. Otherwise, you're wasting your money, time. All right, so on that note, I'll leave it to Nick. So um, we're sort of short on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip through my introductory remarks. But I mean, just to echo some of what my previous, um, the previous speaker said, I think th this side is sort of my representation of InsureTech in, in the insurance value chain through sort of product distribu distribution, underwriting, administration and claims. And I think if you look back at 2016, 2015, 2017, there was a lot of hype around two things, really, in the insurance market. One was around product and distribution, and the other was around blockchain-type technologies. And in the product and distribution, the focus was mostly on retail, and in blockchain, the, the focus was mostly actually in the commercial space of, of how big networks of participants in financial um, services, value chains, could use blockchain to improve sharing of information um, and generate efficiencies that would probably save them in percentage terms, you know, something 1% across, across the entire value chain, but that makes a difference, you know, between a profit on, and, and loss. And I think in, in the product and distribution section, what the, the insure techs, because of the regulatory hurdles to coming into insurance and the capital needed to, you know, stand behind insurance risk, most of the startups were partnering with insurers, and um, frankly, were actually trying products that a lot of insurers had already tried before, just with a different marketing spin. And there was this perception that they were some way going to disrupt the insurance sector, particularly the retail space. And I think it's fair to say that really hasn't happened. If you look at the premium numbers for these businesses, they're, they're not particularly high. There are some high-profile ones that are exceptions to those, that, that, but actually, a lot of them are backed by big insurers or reinsurers, so the capital sitting behind the end product has remained the same. So we haven't sort of had an Uber moment in the retail space where someone's come in and just changed the way the insurance sector um, works. Um, there was some experimentation with peer-to-peer -peer structures. Those did not succeed because they weren't true mutuals where people were providing the risk capital themselves. They were more sophisticated broker distribution plays. Um, and I think they, they fell primarily, they were used in motor, mobile phone, and there are some around today that do group buying thing, group buying type structures bought by many as one, but it's not a true mutual. But they failed because there was a realization that 
you can have a mutual for retail products where you've got quite small risk pools and people trust each other to give reliable information. But the moment you get large risk pools, the information flows don't become, you know, they break down, people don't trust each other sufficiently. And that, that kind of concept of, of, of a small risk pool of people who trust each other and are willing to share risk between them breaks down. And so you've seen some high profile um, failures in, in that space. Um, the, so what has happened really with the insurtechs is, I think as you were alluding to, they, they have now gone into the other parts of the value chain like underwriting and administration of claims where they're trying to make and help insurers and other participants in the insurance space make what I would call incremental gains in, in processes that go on in insurance like underwriting, data analytics and risk assessment. They're trying to help them improve processes rather than you know, revolutionize business model. It's become a cost, it's become a cost play and an efficiency play. Um, where life has and is still quite interesting in the commercial space, particularly in banking, supply chains, energy and insurance, is some of the consortia projects that are going on and there are some in insurance where they're looking at blockchain technologies. And I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not going to um, try to explain what these technologies are in technical terms, because we do a three-hour training session on that where people still have questions at the end of them. But uh, effectively, the, the, the premise of the technology is it can help people share information more efficiently and on a more trusted basis. And from a commercial perspective, that's the key thing. And what, what these consortia projects have done is they've got big big commercial institutions, you know, in some consortia there are six or seven banks and, and there are a number of insurers. B3I, one of the most high profile insurance consortia, has effectively all the big reinsurers and, and a lot of the big primary insurers um, in it. And, and what they're doing is that they're, the technology has been the spark, the inspiration to get together, but what it's actually asked the question is, can we reinvent the way that business is transacted at a fundamental level. Not, this is not about incremental cost gains, this is about reinventing